for ELA grade seven. We're gonna be taking a look at lessons one and two together this week. So for this, we are looking at the idea of perspectives. So in your assignments for this week, you are finding pros and cons of advertisements in school and identifying some of the different perspectives that share those pros and cons. So in order for us to be able to identify those perspectives, we should know what a perspective is. So we can consider a perspective as a particular way of considering something. It's often used synonymously with point of view. So in other words, it is what a bunch of different people or categories of people might be thinking or feeling about a certain topic. We wanna make sure that as many different perspectives are represented as possible. Let's watch a little video clip about the use of advertising for tobacco industries and the effects on teenagers. As you're watching, I'd like you to think about the different perspectives that are being presented and the way that those perspectives are being presented. Kids and the tobacco companies. Take a guess how much money the tobacco companies spend each year on advertising and promotions. Mm, 25 mil. <laughs> Try six billion dollars. That's a lot of bones. Say it, billion dollars? Tobacco companies lure kids into becoming smokers, and kids don't even know it. The ice cream truck came by my house. They, they're selling little gum, yeah, cigarettes. Yeah, yeah, yeah candy candy cigarettes. I heard about yeah, Bubble gum cigarettes. Cigarette. When you blow on them, smoke comes out. Like if it was a real cigarette. Like it's like a starter oh, kit. Man, what about that camel guy? <laughs> What's up with that man? I mean, he, he's this camel trying to get these kids to smoke. For those little kids, like how would they know the difference between if it's a candy cigarette or an actual cigarette? You don't spend six billion dollars unless you expect something big in return. Oh, this looks like a pretty cigarette. <laughs> oh, we're the fat cats and we hooked you, girly. Tobacco companies purposely take advantage of teenagers by creating these false role models. Teenage targets. Oh, come on. You don't dig the cowboy on the horse? All those hot chicks smoking? Excuse me? Oh, not chicks, babes. They got the bullseye on you, what you gonna do? Can't run, can't hide, nigga team coming through. With six billion dollars, my friend, to suck you in. Exotic places, pretty faces, smoke blowing in the wind. Oh, don't get suckered in. They're models and actors getting paid big bucks to act tough and hip and cool. When I see a cigarette ad, all I see is just, like, pretty girls and, like, big muscular guys always holding cigarettes. And they're always, like, in a nice area, like at the beach or something. It's always sunny. You just never see the downside of what, it, like, cigarettes can do. Or like, what's with Virginia Slims? Like, it's a woman thing. Like, it's it's a, it's feminine to smoke. I mean, what what guy really like wants to go out with a girl who smokes? Well, yeah, but we have or that thinks... with the Winston 500, though. <laughs> you know, the NASCAR thing. Like, that's like it's, it's mostly they, guy thing. You they know? appeal to their feminine side and your masculine yeah. side. Like, like. Uh, like a really big icon for cigarettes is the Marlboro Man, and they're trying to make him like a big endorsement thing. Right, you wear the shirts and you're walking around like that, like a walking advertisement for him or whatever. <laughs> Manipulation. <laughs> I love to make my puppets dance. <laughs> this is humiliating. Hasta la vista, Joe. So let's think about some of the perspectives that came up within that video. We have the perspectives of the teens themselves, and then we also have perspectives from the ad companies. So the ad companies first are thinking, hey, you know what? I wanna sell my product. I think we'll make smoking look cool. And we could see that come through um, with some of the information that the teenagers were sharing with us, as well as the examples of the commercials. The teenagers themselves, some of them were angry and upset thinking that they were being tricked by the advertising companies. And those were expressed using direct quotations. And then we have some um, implied or inferred perspectives, like I wonder if babes would like it. So we know that part of the advertising company's goal was to make teenagers think that they would be more popular. And we do know that uh, at least one of the teenagers talked about the idea of uh, babes maybe being attracted to um, a smoker or somebody who would look cool. So we could infer that 
another perspective of a teenager in this advertising scenario might be, hey, I wonder if if girls would like me or boys would like me or if people would think I was cool if I was smoking these cigarettes. So what this has done is given us some different ways to identify perspective. So first, we can look for direct quotations that will actually tell us what the perspective of a certain person might be. We could also find words that may describe how a character or a person within a text is feeling. And so through those feelings, we can get an idea of what their viewpoint is or their perspective. We could consider what we know about a person or a character and the situation that they're in. And then we can use that to figure out what their perspective is. And ultimately, we can use all that information together to make some inferences. A lot of times we have to read between the lines and make inferences in order to truly identify those perspectives. So now it's your turn. You have two articles that you're responsible for reading for this week's lessons. You're going to read both of those articles, Ads Gone Mad and The Wheels on the Bus Go Ka-Ching. And as you're reading those articles, you're taking a look for the different pros and cons associated with uh, advertising in schools. So we're away from tobacco. Now we're just looking at using ads in schools. And then once you've highlighted those pros and cons, you're going to identify the different perspectives that are represented through that evidence. Let's actually take a look at those assignments and see if we can clarify some of those directions and what it is that you're going to be doing. You'll notice when you're completing your assignments for this week that you have been asked to highlight or take notes on the pros and cons of advertisements in school. See that it's noted that it might be helpful to use two different methods of highlighting for each central idea. For example, you could use two different colors or you could underline for one or circle for the other or whatever other coding that you might wanna do. So that means that as you're reading through, whenever you see something that uh, might be a pro of advertising in schools, you could maybe highlight that in yellow or underline that. And then anything that you see as a con, you could highlight in a different color like green or blue or whatever you have available. Or if you don't have the highlighters, then you could maybe circle those um, different pieces of evidence. That'll make it easier for you to delineate the pros and the cons within each article so you can get a better idea of the messages about the central ideas. It'll also help you with the other portion in which you are taking a look at that evidence and then marking whether the perspective was from a student, a parent, a school official, another interested group like a business or corporation, or if it's unknown. So you want to categorize the perspectives that are coming up within each of those articles, and then you'll use this coding system. Um, school official could be like an administrator, uh, or maybe even a board of ed member, um, or maybe even a teacher. Another interested group like a business or a corporation, uh, you would use O to indicate other. If you just don't know who they're affiliated with, whether it's a student or a parent, whether it's somebody associated with the school, or if they're coming from a corporation, if it seems like just some person's uh, perspective, you could use U for unknown. And what that will do is that'll give you an idea of where those uh, pros and cons are coming from, what perspectives are being shown within those articles. Um, so you'll notice that if you look at the article, the first article itself, there have been a couple um, examples done for you. So let's look at the first one. It says, yep, the McDonald's logo appeared on the envelopes until a parent complained about the unhealthy message the advertising could be sending to kids. So this is indicating a con of using the advertising in schools, that it could send an unhealthy message. So that has been highlighted in the color green. And notice that it's a parent who is bringing forth this perspective. So it's been labeled with a P. In the second example, it says some school officials say the cash from such ad deals is necessary so schools can buy all the supplies they need and pay for extra programs and classes. So this would be considered a, a pro. Um, it's saying that the advertising can be helpful for schools so that they can buy supplies and pay for extra programs. And uh, it's coming from a school official. It literally says school officials right here. So it's been highlighted in a different color, the color yellow, and then is labeled with an SO. And so that's what you'll be doing as you're going through the articles, highlighting, indicating where it's a pro or where it's a con, and then um, going back and seeing which perspectives are um, sharing those different pieces of evidence. So good luck and happy annotating.
there, and welcome to the week of June 1st for ELA 7GT Lesson 2. For this lesson, you will be working through some pre-writing strategies to prepare for your end-of-the-unit writing activity, in which you will create an allegory. Your task for this lesson specifically is to organize the research that you did in a previous lesson to develop a moral or political message about your chosen event that can be revealed in an allegory. We will then work to create some pre-writes to prepare you for writing your allegory. A moral message would be a message that gives the audience ideas about what is right versus what is wrong, whereas a political message would be a message that gives the audience ideas about leaders, followers, and power. So as you're planning your allegory, you want to think, what is your message? Let's walk through one of the examples of an allegory that we have examined before. We'll take a look at how Dr. Seuss used characterization and plot in the Lorax to create the allegory. If it's been a while, or if you've never actually read the story, here's a brief summary. The story is told through the perspective of the Onceler, an inventor who causes environmental destruction in order to create products to sell. The Lorax is an advocate for the environment who tries to convince the Onceler to stop destroying the trees. So we can see right here that there's strong allegorical connections to what happens in real life. We know that there are um, industries who do work to tear down forests, and there is something called deforestation. And so what Dr. Seuss was probably doing was making a statement about this environmental destruction. And so those messages would be moral messages. And some of those examples of moral messages uh, that are developed through the Lorax might be greediness can lead to overuse of natural resources. If we don't use sustainable practices, we can harm the ecosystem. If we harm one part of the ecosystem, it affects all the other parts. Or maybe we should speak up to let others know about caring for the environment. So um, let's take a look at how these messages are developed through some of the narrative elements in the story. So if we look at those narrative elements, um, we can see that characters and setting play a big part. So in this chart, uh, we can see that on the left-hand side, we're looking at individuals, groups, places, and systems in real life. You will be working with a chart like this to plan your own allegory. So what you want to think about are those individuals, groups, places, and systems within the research that you have done for whichever historical event you are choosing to use for your allegory. In the case of the Lorax, uh, we know that we have greedy corporations who can't harvest sustainably and who pollute. That is something that happens in real life. In real life, there's nature that is destroyed by corporations. There are environmental activists or there are even parts of an ecosystem that speak up to warn us to use sustainable practices. There are other parts of the ecosystems whose lives are harmed when the corporations destroy a part of the ecosystem. And then the actual destruction of the parts of the ecosystem come up um, in real life too and are represented in the story. Then on the right hand side of the chart, we have the characters, objects, and settings that Dr. Seuss used in order to represent these things in real life. So those greedy corporations are being represented by the Onceler who comes and uh, greedily takes all the truffula trees in order to create products. The nature that is destroyed are the truffula trees. Uh, the environmental activist or the part of the ecosystem that speaks up is the Lorax, who is speaking for the trees. There are other animals within that truffle of forest that ends up getting driven out of the forest uh, by the Onceler. So those represent those animals who are affected by the deforestation or the destruction of the ecosystem. And then the destruction of the parts of our ecosystem in real life are represented by the destruction of the truffle of forest in the Lorax. What we're going to do now is take a look at the parts of the plot. So what Dr. Seuss does is he uses those characters and settings in order to craft a plot and to get those moral messages across about the effects of greed or the effects of deforestation. So we start, of course, with the exposition. Now, Dr. Seuss does something really interesting with his exposition in this story. He uses a nonlinear timeline strategy called in media ray, which is Latin for into the middle of things. So this is when a story begins somewhere within the plot rather than using the clear setup type of exposition. 
In this case, the story begins almost at the end. This is after the Lorax has already been gone for some time, and the Onceler has become something of a recluse. And what we see is a little boy who is looking for answers about the Lorax and, and where he went and what happened. Even in this structure, you get a sense of the Onceler's character and what he represents. When the narrator says that he'll only tell the story of the Lorax if you're willing to pay. You can see this excerpt here. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. So we already get a little hint at who the Onceler is and uh, the extent of his greed. Once he begins the story, we get a flashback scenario where he begins to give the reader more of a classic exposition where he describes the setting of the truffle trees and the animals who lived there. This provides a nice setup for his allegory because we can see how healthy and happy things were before the Onceler came. Let's take a look at a little clip from the movie of the Lorax from 1972 so we can get a better idea of how that part of the exposition sets up that really nice, happy atmosphere. It all started way back, such a long, long time back, way back in the days when the grass was still green and the pond was still wet and the clouds were still clean and the song of the swami swans rang out in space. One morning I came to this glorious place then I saw the trees, the truffula trees, the bright colored tufts of the truffula trees, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze. And under the trees, I saw brown barbaloots frisking about in their barbaloot suits. Under the trees, happy daffy barbaloots, under the trees, in our barbaloot suits. Under the trees, eating truffula fruits, holy succulent, Sweetly succulent fluous truffula fruits. Summertime's a coming, coming under the trees. Hum and fish a hum and hum under the trees. Under the trees. Oh, this glorious. Splendidulous. Splendorious. Splendidulous. Bandy flandy flindulous truffula trees. Next, we move on to the rising action, which begins with the first truffle tree being cut down and used by the Onceler to make his first sneed. Immediately, the Lorax pops up to ask why he's cutting down the trees. We see right away that the Onceler cares about industry and product, while the Lorax speaks out against the destruction of the truffle forest. Here we can see how impassioned the Lorax is about protecting the trees. So one of the first times he speaks, he says, Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze, I am the Lorax, I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. He was very upset as he shouted and puffed. What's that thing you've made out of my truffula tuft? So the Lorax is a very strong advocate here, and we can see how he aligns with any environmental activists or anybody else who might speak out against uh, deforestation. The rising action continues as the Onceler continues to grow his business and cut down more truffula trees, despite the pleading from the Lorax to stop. He even creates a machine to cut down more trees and make speedier work of the job. As the rising action continues to build, the animals who were so happy among the truffula trees and who relied on nature for their homes are forced to leave. Once again, with the Lorax acting as their advocate and pleading with the Onceler to stop, to stop his destruction. You can see in the first excerpt, he snapped, I'm the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbaloots, who played in the shade in their barbaloot suits and happily lived eating truffula fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there's not enough truffula fruit to go round and my poor barbaloots are all getting the crummies because they have gas and no food in their tummies. And then a little later, he says, I am the Lorax, he coughed and he whiffed. He sneezed and he snuffled, he snarkled, he sniffed. Onceler, he cried with a cruffulous croak. Onceler, you're making such smogulous smoke. 
my poor swami swans why they can't sing a note no one can sing who has smog in his throat and then finally you're glumping the pond where the humming fish hummed no more can they hum for their gills are all gummed so i'm sending them off oh their future is dreary they'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary so this draws a direct parallel to what we see in our own world as a result of growing industry and deforestation the animals being forced to leave their homes or their numbers growing sick or dying out because of some of those effects of the industry no food smog or poor air quality um, or poor water quality um, or places that the animals can't live anymore so all of that builds the climax when the onceler finally snaps back at the lorax showing his greed and selfishness as he does not even acknowledge the damage that he's doing as he's yelling at the lorax about his rights the last tree is cut down so we see the onceler say and then i got mad i got terribly mad i yelled at the lorax now listen here dad all you do is yap yap and say bad 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 well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you, I intend to go on doing just what I do. And for your information, your Lorax, I'm figuring on biggering and biggering and biggering and biggering, turning more truffula trees into thneeds, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. So he's justifying his actions and not even giving the slightest indication of remorse that he has destroyed this entire forest. And then at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an ax on a tree. Then we heard the tree fall, the very last truffula tree of them all. So this is gonna come to the, at the end of the climax and lead us to our falling action. So as a result of those events in the climax, the Lorax realizes he's failed to do his job and save the forest and that really there's nothing else he can do. So he leaves. The Lorax said nothing, just gave me a glance, just gave me a very sad, sad backward glance as he lifted himself by the seat of his pants. And I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place through a hole in the smog without leaving a trace. We can see that the Onceler is affected by this at least a little bit, and we get an indication that he might begin to feel some remorse for what he's done. Um, as he mentions the, the, I'll never forget the grim look on his face. Which then leads us towards a resolution where we finally learn that the Onceler has remained haunted by the Lorax and by the effect that he has had on the once lush environment. And he, he sort of ends up realizing that he must fix things by passing the last truffle seed to someone who will care enough to regrow the forest. In the resolution, Dr. Seuss directly states one of his messages. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. This is his call to action to let readers know that they have the power to rectify this moral dilemma and to do the right thing. Dr. Seuss's use of creative characters and settings in a logical plot that mirrors the real world leads to an effective allegory that sends a clear moral message about deforestation and advocacy. If we were to take the events of this plot and lay it out in the outline that you will use to pre-write your allegory, you can see what it would look like. So in that exposition where we introduce the setting and characters, we begin with the once learned his tower. He begins to tell the story of the Lorax and he sets up that setting by describing the Truffula Forest. And then the rising action, we begin by the once cutting down the first Truffula tree and drawing the Lorax out to question what he is doing. And then that continues to build. He continues cutting down trees, causing the animals to leave. And all throughout that, the Lorax is coming in saying, please stop, please stop. We can also see the Onceler getting a little frustrated with the Lorax um, as he continues to come back and bother him about stopping his development. We reach the climax once uh, the Onceler snaps at the Lorax, kind of reaches his tipping point and tells, tells the Lorax that he has a right to cut down the trees. And then he threatens to make things bigger and bigger. And then finally, that last tree is cut down, which then leads us to that falling action where um, recognizing that there's nothing more he can do, the Lorax leaves. And then the resolution, the Onceler realizes he's made a mistake. He passes the truffle of seed to the boy who's visiting. 
And Dr. Seuss leaves us with a call to action for those who care to make things better. So now it's your turn. You'll use the notes you've gathered from your research and you'll determine ultimately whether you want your message to be political or moral. So keep in mind, the main point of the allegory is to get that message across. So what are some of your ideas for the messages that you could convey about the historical event that you have researched? You're gonna brainstorm some interesting characters, objects, and settings that you could use to represent the individuals, groups, places, and systems in your historical event. What I'd recommend doing is begin by listing those individuals, groups, places, and systems in the event. So think about who was involved, what happened, what are some of those key pieces of that event that you want to come up with in your allegory so that you can make um, the message that you intend to make. And then brainstorm some creative characters, objects, and settings. Um, you can play with this some and have a little fun with it. Notice that Dr. Seuss creates completely new characters that don't actually exist in the real world. You're welcome to do that too. Or like an animal farm, maybe you'd like to use animals to represent um, some of those individuals. Um, or you can come up with some creative ways to use people. So feel free to be super creative with it. Once you've got some ideas um, for who your characters um, and your settings and your objects might be and what's going to be represented, you can start to lay out some ideas for how you're going to use those in your plot. So what is your story actually going to be and how are all of those other elements going to work together in order to convey whatever message you've decided on? Please remember that this is just a pre-write. So write down as many different ideas as you have and don't worry if it doesn't feel perfect right now. You'll probably find that some things will change as you work with it a little more and as you begin to draft things out next week. So have fun, good luck, and happy pre-writing.